Good morning, ladies. Um, I want to thank you for coming out this morning and um, your interest in hearing Judy Smith's and her testimonies. Um, we are live streaming this this morning as well, so for you on uh, live stream, good morning. Um, if you'll bow your heads, please, we'll have an opening prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sisters who have come out this morning and pray that you would be with those that aren't able to attend today. Um, we are so thankful for the many blessings you bestow upon us each daily, and um, Pray that the lady's ears will be in tune to the message that you would have them to hear. Be with Judy, that she would um, be able to speak freely and clearly and um, share of your goodness. So, Lord, I thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon each and every one of us and pray that these things in Jesus' most holy name, amen. Um, with that, uh, our guest speaker is Judy Smith, and um, she is going to share testimonies of her car accident and of the clinic that they have set up in Kenya. So um, we'll let Judy come on up. We're really excited to hear what she has to tell us today. I'm going to need one of these, you guys. It's been the way life is. <laughs> um, I am just, just so thankful to be with you all this morning. And um, I think part of that is because um, I feel like God has done so much for me. But also, when you're away from the center place for so long, you really miss um, getting together with like-minded people brothers and sisters, and so I'm just going to need this. I just know it. So uh, anyway, um, um, the Lord has really um, taught me a lot um, these last few years, and I know Doug too, and today I kind of wanted to start off with just what we've been doing for the last couple years. Um, what has life been like? And so I'm starting off with talking about the clinic and maybe that will answer some of your questions, some of the things that maybe you have a question about. But I kind of want to start with how this all started. Um, and it started back in 2012. And in 2012, Doug went with uh, the men, the priesthood, out to Kirtland, as they do yearly. And while he was there, he had fasted that Saturday and he had uh, been talking to God about um, what do you want me to, to be doing? What should I be focusing my life on? And he felt that the Spirit was telling him that there was a need for um, uh, medical clinic, medical help, as well as missionary help. Uh, because, you know, there's been uh, outreach and missionary work in Kenya and other African countries for years. Um, and as these thoughts started coming to him, he just began writing them down. And, um, of course, then that fall, uh, my mother had a complication from her procedure, and she ended up coming to live with us. And um, because of her being there, it was pretty obvious that that was not going to be a time in life to go and look for any kind of opportunity. It would be more permanent in Kenya. And... Uh, then in 2018, in January, mom passed away. And then that following, I believe, summer, uh, Doug was approached by an individual who said, you know, um, I really feel like God is leading, uh, prompting that there needs to be some support in, in, uh, in Kenya. And uh, do, you have any, do you have any thoughts about that? And Doug said, well, you know, he's thinking the missionary. He says, well, you know, you can always, church can always use help. You can always support the church. And this individual said, well, I'm kind of really feeling like this needs to be healthcare, maybe focused. What do you think about that? And Doug said, well, let me tell you about an experience I had. And so he shared about um, what had happened to him in Kirtland eight years earlier. And, um, or actually it was six years earlier. And, um, um, and that kind of is what, what started things. Um, it was just kind of, 
God's timing. And, you know, when mom passed away, it wasn't soon after until that happened. And then that fall, um, Doug had been able to register a clinic in the name of Mildred Smith Mission Health Center in here in the United States. So that, it just started progressing very quickly. And um, so it, it was just kind of the way it was. And you know, at the time when he had that experience, it wasn't like so much that I had that experience, but I was more than willing to support him. And as you'll hear later, um, I learned a lot from having to really relinquish myself to really jumping in full, full throttle with that, with that too. So um, it is called the Mildred Smith Mission, Mission Health Center. And the reason why is because when Doug was talking with the church people over there, men and women, um, they requested that it should be named after Mildred Smith. And because, you know, she had been over there to teach, um, they knew her, and they were really inspired that somebody, even as late into her 80s, would come over to Africa and to, to share with them. And so that's why it's called the Mildred Smith Mission Health Center. Mission is added in there because Eric Odita thought, you know, that lets people know that it's a, it's a nonprofit place and it's associated with, you know, people who are willing to care because, because of their love for the Lord. And so that's why it is there. Um, we had to, there were, there were lots of um, governmental bureauc bureaucratic things to get through to even get it that way. And so this was in 2018 when Doug got a register here. Um, and so it took till um, January of 21 for it to actually open because there's just so much red tape to go through. Um, and so um, this is when they painted the sign on the, the property we were renting. Um, and, but before, before Doug, we were actually open to, you know, Doug was traveling over there. He was um, volunteering at like the government hospital in Kasumu, Kenya. And Kasumu is where um, Pam and Eric Odita live. And there's a lot of church members there. They have a pretty strong church congregation there. And so he would go around to different clinics and, and just visit with them and just find out how's the best way to do things, you know, as far as even what do you do with your waste and things, just little things that we don't really think about day to day here. And so that's a picture of me in August of uh, 20. You know, COVID was going strong, right? And I went over there, I took some time off from my job and went over there and of course you had to have the shield, the mask and everything else. And so it was quite, quite the deal traveling, but um, I went over there in August and we kind of went around and did some more things in Nairobi with the government. And this is actually the building that we rented in Kisumu. It's uh, actually a home uh, that a man owned and we took it and we kind of renovated it a little bit. We made a place for we had exams rooms. We made a place, uh, built up the kitchen cabinets because a lot of times when you go to these homes, there, there isn't a lot of cabinetry or things like that we normally have here. And so we had to do some little bit of renovation. We had to put a guard shack. You see that little green tin building off to the, to the right for the guard at night to have some protection from the elements and mosquitoes and things like that. So that is where we, we were there from January till about May. And the man who owned this, um, he was a pastor. And, but as is often the case over there, when they see somebody with pale skin, they really get excited because it's such a wonderful thing because you know, things are, you're going to be a little bit more prosperous. And so when we moved in, he then said, well, you know, I, I did some improvement on, uh, there's a building behind this. He goes, I did some improvement there, so I'm going to need to raise your rent. And we knew this was a possibility from the very beginning that this could happen wherever we rented from. And so we really started praying that God will open some doors so we could get out of this rental situation into something that we could purchase with the money had been donated for the clinic ministry. And so um, we had been talking with um, Eric Odita and Tom Okeo, and they had uh, established like a technical school in another town about 45 minutes away from Kisumu. 
He was in Awasi, and they have called it a Tinzion, a Tinzion, and um, they had started this school there. And we had been there before, but to even once you get off the main road to get to the school, you have to go down a very rough, rocky road, really rough, rocky road. And so we really weren't drawn to even going out that far. Plus, you know, it's 45 minutes away from Kasumu, like, and it's more rural. And so we, we did look at it, but after, after this and after really, really weighing out all the things, uh, we thought, well, maybe it might not be a bad idea. And then we found out uh, in April that the property next to the school, um, the man was willing to sell it. And it had a house on it, and it had plenty of, of land space. We went out and looked at it, and we said, you know, maybe this is where the Lord is leading this ministry to go. And so we were able to purchase that land and the building. And uh, this is just one of the exam rooms inside that house we rented. Um, I will back up a little bit. This is a picture of some gowns that I, I asked the women at Lexington to look at some of their old fabrics and sheets because we have some seamstresses there and to make some gowns for the clinic because I wanted something a little bit more colorful. I didn't want, the, you know, what we have is the, the blue, whatever here. And I wanted something a little bit more colorful and so they came through. Um, again, this is at the original clinic, so I'm, I'm backing up. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, these are our, our original employees. Um, the woman over here with the mask on is Evelyn Oyata and she got the floors mopped, she took care of things, she watched over the property, you know, during the day. The middle guy in the red is called Efko Loss, he's a church member. These are all, they're all church members except for the girl on the very, very right. Um, but he's been, I, I've known him since she, he was in junior high, because when we were over in Kenya in 2007, um, he was a little, little guy, a little junior high age guy at, at Sunday school in Nairobi there. And he's, uh, he's got very great leadership potential. Um, just one of those guys that God, I think, just put into our path. Um, when we first got over there, we were really looking at um, who we would have to come help Doug with interpretation, with understanding the medications and things like that, because it is quite different than here. And Eric said, you know, have you checked with uh, EPCO? I'm like, well, we, he has a job, you know, he's in Nairobi, we really didn't think about that. But we called him, and he agreed to come work with us. And he had taken out a year, he had started medical school. He was trained as what we call a clinical officer, which is kind of like, uh, maybe not as well trained as a nurse practitioner, but they can do, a, they can see patients, suturing, things like that. And so... Um, he had taken off some time from medical school because he ran out of money, quite literally. He ran out of money. And it was a very dark time for him in his life to have to, to step back like that. And um, so he said, sure, I'll come out and, and work with you guys till the following September, hoping that I can resume medical school. We're like, great. So he came. And, you know, he was, he was probably the best person that, Doug, that the Lord could have put on our pathway for this because he knew so many people. He was able to be an advocate for things we needed and the supplies. And um, for us not knowing very much about how things were in Kenya, Efko was our guy. And I call him Efko, but his real name that I know him by is Ian. But he changed his name from Ian to Efko because um, his history of growing up um, with a lot of uh, heartache and abuse, he felt like he just wanted a new name. He wanted a new name, so he, I think he went to a video place, and they on the machine said some of that EFGO, kind of like the alphabet of the thing, and so he said, EFCO. So anyway, he goes by EFCO now instead of Ian, but um, he's just, he was a huge, huge blessing and, uh, for what we were starting. And then uh, we hired a receptionist, and we had to rehire a receptionist because we also needed someone who could um, report our statistics to the medical facility there. Like, so when someone comes in with pneumonia, you're supposed to report that to the, the governmental thing so they can keep track of all the different disease processes, right? And so we hired Brenda. And um, so those, that was our staff. And then me and Doug, I was the nurse and Doug was the consultant. And um, 
So you'd have Doug seeing patients with EFCO, and I would be, you know, drawing blood or anything like that, and then Brenda would be reading them and also interpreting and explaining the billing procedure and things like that. So um, that was our that was what we started out with. Um, again, this is at the gate in front of that house, and. Um, in order to do this, we had to have a local director. So Eric Odita was our local director, uh, and this was just for governmental requirements. And um, I will say that, you know, in getting all this organized, um, we, we registered it in Kenya as a nonprofit. And as we were trying to get certain numbers and credentials, we were not getting anywhere with we had to have a certain identification number that we absolutely had to have and it was just so complicated and I like to joke that I think I have PSD whenever I go into the government offices in Nairobi because it's quite literally you are not welcome when you walk in there and they do not treat you with any kind of consideration at all it's kind of like going to the DMV how it used to be here you know where you would go and you're like eh. That's the way it was, multiplied by 10. And so I got to the point where I just couldn't even go into the medical, uh, the medical pharmaceutical building anymore with Doug because I would just get, I'd be like, just say, you know what you need. I'm over there trying to, you know, whisper really loud. And I was like, and I just had to not go in there anymore with him because I just, my emotions would get too much in front of me because they were just so unhelpful. But um, so Eric is there at the end with Doug and I. And then Tom O'Kay was standing right next to the sign, and Tom's been in the church for as, as long as Eric has, and um, he was kind of our, our secondary director because we needed to have someone else to, and we've got Efko, Brenda, and Evelyn there. So that was probably one of our first pictures when we finally got things rolling in January of 21. And that's just a picture of Pam Odita checking in with Brenda, you know, trying to uh, take some pictures for some pamphlets that we made to hand out to people. And um, I have this picture. This is a picture of Holda Simba. And she is um, a relative of Eric's. And we have known her for quite a while. And when I first met her, I thought she was in, you know, I would have probably been in my 40s. I thought she was maybe in her 60s or 70s because she, she had gone through a lot of ill health because of her lifestyle. And um, when we when we opened up the clinic, Helda came to see us because she'd had she'd had eye cancer, which is why she's wearing the patch. So she had a lot of really severe pain in her eye, and it was getting to the point where she thought she was going to die. She was at her her the end of what she could possibly process with with life, and she came to see us, and we sent her for a CT, um, and there was no cancer. Uh, but again, she had this pain that she couldn't, she literally couldn't sleep at night. The pain was so bad. And so um, I was aware that there was another uh, NGO in um, Kenya by the name of Kenya Relief and was started from a, an anesthesi a nurse anesthetist down in Tennessee. And he had started the surgery center in honor of his daughter. And um, so I had been in communication with him somewhat, and Doug had two. And they have teams that come in from the U.S. and do surgeries for a week uh, on different things, like maybe eyes or hernias or whatever kind of, how you ever want to divide that up. And um, so we sent Hulda down to see them. And um, it was really a, you can see God's hand in this, but when she went down, her daughter took her down there and uh, she had an appointment to be seen, and there was, when they walked in, there was just a, a large amount of people sitting down waiting to be seen. And um, and they were like, what do we do? We don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. And this is, there's just so, so many people here waiting to be seen. And um, the daughter went up to someone who they felt was in uh, leadership there and, and asked about it. And they said, well, come on, come on with us. And they got her back there in pretty record time. She didn't have to sit down and wait or anything like that. In fact, I think she, they thought she was somebody else, perhaps. Um, but they ended up uh, attending and caring for Hulda that day. They ended up doing an injection, a nerve block in her, in her eye. And um, this is a picture of the physician who was a part of that. And Hulda came, after she left there, she was pain-free, no pain. And she hasn't had pain since that time, and that's been... 
it'll be probably a year coming up in a couple months. And so we were just really thankful that we had, we had reach with other people there who were willing to help. And it, it, was, it didn't cost her any money. They were doing that for free. And so Hulda was not going to be able to afford anything like that because she's a widow and she, she does not have any income except for what her family supports her with. So that was, that was a real, real big blessing. Um, you know, while we were there, we had the clinic going on. We were seeing people for their health needs, but we were also very much involved with the ministry in the church. And so uh, we attended pretty regularly the con congregation in Kisumu. So, you know, there were baptisms to go to. There were there was classes to be a part of. Um, other congregations an hour away from Kisumu to go and to visit and be a part of. So a lot of meeting of people and a lot of um, just hearing people's experiences of what had brought them into the church and to their relationship with God. Um, this picture is a picture of our lab at the first house. And I was kind of thinking out of the box because I'm from the United States, not from Kenya. So I said, why don't we just say room, put the refrigerator up on the counter? And they're like, you know, it's a little unconventional, but it would work. And because I was thinking, you know, we're really only using the bottom of part of the refrigerator, not, not the freezer at all. So we stuck that up there. And then we had three salt, small machines that were just uh, like, you know, I could get a drop of blood put it on a little thing, and put it in that machine. It would give us um, some values for Doug to go off for a diagnosis. And so that's what we started off with. And then we, we moved to Awasi. We actually got some real lab machines. And um, again, because of the, uh, the gracious and generous donations of, of people from the United States, I mean, like, we can, we can do most any lab test. In fact, we are a, a level of our lab that is probably one of the better ones on the eastern side of Kenya. Uh, a higher one would be probably at really, uh, really large facilities, which uh, there aren't that many, but uh, we can do pretty thorough testing. Um, I just, I'm not gonna go into this, but public hospital, dispensary, and private hospital, that's the type of treatment. If you go to public facility, you just get, they just give it at you. As compared to a private hospital, you get the adequate of what you need. Um, so this is the the property at Awasi that we are in now. And this was a picture when we were first going to look at it. It was a, a home that was two units side by side. And what we needed to do, we, we wanted to combine it all into one building. So we took the middle wall out between the two living rooms in that building and um, we opened up a porch because we thought, well, we don't know how much longer COVID precautions are going to be in, in effect here. So we maybe, besides waiting inside, they could wait outside even if it's raining. So we had to do some renovation on it. And this is kind of what it ended up with. Uh, we have the porch. Um, we have the black water tanks there. So the water we use at that clinic is all rainwater that's collected from the roof. It drains into those tanks. And... That's what we use. Um, and I know we don't do a lot of that here in Missouri, um, but I knew they did a lot of that in Australia and in some parts of the United States, too. I'm assuming people are doing that. But that's, that's our water source is rainwater. Um, so we don't drink that water <laughs> uh, because there could be organisms and things in it still from drainage, but we do use it for, like, laundry and, and washing and things like that. Uh, this is when you come in, you check in with Brenda at the, the desk there. And um, a lot of the way, payment for goods um, in Kenya is kind of a little different from here. We have, they have a system called M-Pesa, which is mobile money. And that's what that little sign is there on the right. There's a number there. And if people come in, they can take their phone, their cell phone, and they can get into their M-Pesa account, and they can, it takes money from that M-Pesa account and goes to our M-Pesa account. So it's kind of like a debit card on your phone. And a lot of people use that. Like, if I go to the grocery store, I'll use my M-Pesa account. I won't carry, I don't usually carry cash shillings with me or anything like that. I, I use M-Pesa. So that's why we, we had that set up there as well. This is the waiting room when you walk in. So 
if you can imagine, instead of that big door, there used to be a wall down the middle of that room, and there were two separate doors. And of course, we had plenty of room, so people could social distance. And, um, and that's what you would find when you came in. Another picture of the same waiting area. Um, that door, that brown door, is where we had the uh, consultation room to begin with. And so patients would check in with her, sit down, and then they would go in and see Doug or Efco or, or whoever else was there. Um, and we did, when we moved out there, we actually, uh, we had to hire um, a lab technician because of the lab equipment we have. I was not able to use that equipment at all because I'm not trained at all for that. So we hired a young man uh, by the name of Zablon Odongo, except he likes to be called Zabby. And um, he has been a real blessing too. He's a hard worker, a good work ethic, and um, so he's been running our lab for us. And this is who we have now. So we started out with three and me and Doug, and now we have Doug, and next to Doug is our nurse, uh, Lucas Otieno. And um, he's kind of had to learn how to work with an American doctor because he's very much Kenyan and he's a nurse, but he's, I would say he's more like what we used to train for a licensed practical nursing, LPN. So not a lot of, not a lot of training that way. So he would say, he would come and say things to me like, well, Judy goes, I, um, I'm, I'm kind of trying out some things that I, I, I've heard. Like, you know, I, I've heard that you're never supposed to take your baby out in rain because if the rainwater falls on their tongue, it will cause a speech impediment. I was like, oh, well, that's, that's interesting, Lucas. Um, yeah, I think it's good that you're trying out that's really true or not, you know. And he would come up with things like that. Even with Doug, he would, he would just not understand what Doug's thought process was. So it's taken some time, and we're still working with him, but I think he's finally seeing that we do a little things, things a little bit differently. And then, of course, next to me is Evelyn, again, and Brenda. And then next to Brenda is uh, Pressler Odita. And when we moved out there, um, uh, EFCO had to go back to school, of course, in September, which she was able to do. And then Pressler came, I think, in later November of that year. And he has uh, graduated from medical school. He's done a year of internship. And so normally, uh, in your Kenya, in that situation, you can go out to work as a, uh, what would they call a medical officer? We would call them a doctor. And, or you can go back, uh, and if you have a lot of money, you can do a residency for extra training. If you don't have money, then you might have to work for two or three or four years to get the money because there, to do residency, you have to pay the doctor to tutor you. If they don't get paid by that doctor, they have to pay. So you have to have some money on hand. And then of course next to Pressler is Zabby. And that's our gang that we have now. Uh, that's kind of a, a look into the lab from the little hallway there that takes into it. This was originally a kitchen, so we just kind of Finished out a little bit more and made the kitchen into a lab. This is looking out the front door into the compound. Um, we've got our clothesline over there to the left. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but hang up our laundry out there. And then that little green building in the very far end, where you see those fence posts, that's the edge of the property. And then if you, if you keep on following that edge post out to the le left, there's a lane that takes you out to the really rough, rocky road. Um, that's how you get back into the town of uh, Awasi. But that, that is a guard shack for our night guard, because we have to have someone there at night to make sure that everything's good and make sure that the generator's running and things like that. And so that's what was built for him. Um, I did want to say that there's several th things we have in the clinic that kind of communicate our um, philosophy with health. And one, of course, we put up a sign that says Word of Wisdom, and we have Section 86 there. And um, we've gone over this with our staff because, you know, Zabby and Lucas and Brenda are not church members. They have been to some of our worship services, but they aren't familiar with our beliefs. And so we've explained to them, this is why we have this sign up on the wall, because, you know, the Lord has told us we want to have healthy bodies. We can't, you know, there's certain things, alcohol and, alcohol and tobacco and things like that are not going to help us. And 
Doug uses this, um, the teachings of the Word of Wisdom, every day in his clinic because people there, they, they don't always have the healthiest lifestyle. They often are relying on alcohol and other drugs just to give them hope for the day or the week, and usually it is a day-by-day -day process. They don't, they don't think ahead as to what I'm going to be doing next week. It's a day-by-day -day process. And so that has really been something that Doug really felt like he wanted there, and I think it's, it's been a good uh, proclamation of what we do. Um, in, um, in February of 22, just this last February, we were able to get the, the funds to purchase a vehicle. And this is a four-wheel drive. It's a Land Rover. And it used to be a Red Cross vehicle that Kenya, the Red Cross, used. And um, they have an auction every once in a while. So they were auctioning off vehicles and were able to go make some bids at an auction. Long story short, we were able to get this vehicle. And uh, Doug and I had come back in, um, in uh, August um, of, last, of, 22, of 21. And uh, we, the vehicle had been purchased in, in um, well, I said 22, but actually we got that in, I guess it was, I'm getting trouble with my, my numbers here, guys, so just forgive me on that. Um, when we finally got the vehicle, because it had to be repainted and just made usable again, because they'd stripped it of all the um, Red Cross things in there. Uh, when we got back and we got picked up the vehicle from Nairobi, drove it back, I think it was two days later, we actually had to use it to go pick up a patient um, in a nearby community. He was a church member, and the story we got was that he had been sick for some time. Eric had called us to go check on him because he had not been able to walk for a couple months. And so we were like, so I was like, man, the timing on getting that vehicle was just perfect, Lord, because it really... There hadn't really been a need for to do that up to that time until we got back, found out about Joshua and his not being able to walk, and um, so we were able to go out and get him in this vehicle. And where he lived is not an easy place, or even you know it's it's rough and it's muddy when it rains. And so this enabled us to get to him, and has enabled us to get to a lot of places since that time because it is a four-wheel drive vehicle, and we don't get stuck. Um, so we were using it within days of actually bringing it back to Owasi. And it was a real blessing. Um, that's at Joshua's house. And, uh, that, of course, Lucas and, uh, and Pressler and the other, the other man there was actually working at the Atenzion school at the time. And he went with them and uh, able to get Joshua gotten back to Owasi so we could look at him. Then months later down the road, we finally got some signage out on the, the road, the main road, before you get on the really rough, rocky road. And um, because, you know, people say, oh, you know, I think when we get those signs up, you will have more people coming. Because on the average, we would see anywhere from one to maybe two or three patients a day up to that time. And if it was somebody who has had an involved health history, it might take four or five hours for Doug to assess them because you had to have Doug talking and then interpretation and things like that. And... When you have someone who speaks a different language and thinks a different way culturally, you can ask them a question. They may go into a long story about something, and it's not, a, it's not like here in the United States where we just answer the questions. I mean, sometimes we get a little bit verbose, right? But most of the time, we just answer the questions. So um, they were like, well, if we get the signs up, we'll, we'll be even better. Well, people will know we're here finally. So we got the sign in, and um, of course, everybody was more than willing to help, had, had lots of helpers out there. And, and that was a big step, too. We were really happy we were able to do that. Um, I have this picture because um, even, even with the clinic, we're able to, I, I feel like we just have those opportunities to go ministering to people. And the lady, um, Ethel, was standing on the very far right, and there's a woman with a skirt, striped skirt, standing next to her. And she had come and helped us out at the clinic when Doug and I had left um, that July before, uh, be, actually before the accident. And uh, she, her name was Mercy, and she was a nurse, and she was probably the best nurse we could have found to fill in for us while we were gone that month. Um, in fact, when we had talked with her, and we, we found out about her through Tom Okeo. He had a relative who worked at the clinic, and the, at this clinic, Mercy worked there. And 
So we, we talked with her, and uh, she hadn't gotten paid for like six months from the government. So she, you know, she was just kind of waiting for them to finally pay her after six months. And so she was more than willing to come and, and help us out at the clinic. And she had just a really good way with people. She was very understanding, compassionate, and just was a great blessing uh, to be able to know things were in her hand. And she got well with so many people. And in fact, um, the chief of uh, the area, the Kenyan chief, the tribal chief, had come uh, to see how things were there. And he said, um, he goes, where did you get that nurse? He goes, you know, she's the best nurse in this whole area. And I was like, well, thank you, Lord, <laughs> for that, because we, we didn't know what kind of really, what her reputation was, but he said, she's the best. And she is, so, she was so, so good. Um, her father had come in to see us after we had gotten back, and um, Doug has a little handheld um, ultrasound that he did training over here to use. And, and he was jaundiced, so we knew there was probably something going on with his liver. And it turned out he had a, a, a mass in his liver. And so we figured it was probably cancer. Uh, so we talked with Mercy about that and gave her the options. Um, and he would end up passing away. Um, all, not all that long ago. And so we went over to Mercy's house. Is That's the tradition there. Uh, when someone loses someone, you go to their home. You don't call them. You don't text them like we do here or whatever. You, you, you go in person and you see them face to face. And so we went over to Mercy's house and we were just gonna, we were just gonna say hi and just say, you know, we're, we want you to know we're supporting you in this. We had a little monetary donation, which again is traditional. And so we had our picture taken with them and she ended up feeding us an evening meal. Um, which is also what they do, but we just weren't expecting that. We said, you know, we came to comfort you, not for you to feel, fill our tummies with food, uh, but, you know, that's just the way they are. They're just a very loving, uh, peaceful people. And I don't know if you can see that I'm holding a chicken in my arms. It kind of matches my dress. It matches my dress. <laughs> And you probably, I don't know if you can tell from my expression, but I'm thinking, here I am holding this chicken, trying to act like I just hold a chicken every day of my life, right? Or I'm just grabbing chickens. And you guys, I will tell you, I grew up on a farm. We had chickens for my early childhood, so I, I'm used to chickens. But um, again, and it was, its feet were kind of tied, but um, Mercy and her family gave that chickens, gave that chicken to us just as a way of saying, well, thank you for coming and supporting us. And I was, so I was like, here we're coming to comfort her, and she's blessing us as best they know how. And so we took that chicken, and we had that for lunch the next day at the clinic. I was not involved with the, that at all. Someone else did that because um, people love chickens there, especially Zabby. Zabby loves chicken. He's actually from a different tribe than... Uh, a lot of people in that area are from the Luo tribe, like Pam and Eric and, and Dean and all those guys. They're all Luo. And uh, uh, Laz Abbey's actually a Luya, and so he gets teased about that, too. Um, we've seen a lot of different people with a lot of chronic problems. Um, I put this one up. Uh, Eric had a friend that he had worked with when he worked for the governor. And that was a very stressful job, 24-7. Eric was expected to be available to the governor. He was kind of like chief of staff. So he had a very, a very important position. But he had a friend who was also very much involved with the government, very high standing. And this friend had uh, been suffering from ill health. He, uh, he wasn't able to eat. He lost a lot of weight. Um, he, he had reflux, and he just... He had been to many, many doctors, and he had the money to go to many, many doctors. And they had put him through a rigmarole of, you know, having him buy a special pillow so his reflux maybe wouldn't be what was causing the, he had a chronic cough. And even when he came to see us at the clinic, it was a Saturday, and Eric brought him out, and we just sit down, and he just had, he had a glass of water because he would just cough, drink, cough, drink. But he had really lost hope. He lost hope in, um, in life, and he wasn't getting answers from any of these other 
specialist that he was going to see. And so we sat down and we just, Saturday we just sat down and, and asked questions and listened. And um, for somebody who'd been having like a chronic cough for a year, no one had ever sent him for chest x-ray. And I was like, that's just so backwards. I mean, I go, I'm a nurse and I would even probably send someone for chest x-ray, but they've been having a chronic cough. But for some reason they thought he had reflux, so they just didn't send him for that. And there were some other things they had. They had never recommended him to go have a, a upper endoscopy to look down and see if there was, you know, reflux. And he could have afforded to do that. But by the time he came to see us, he had spent most of his money on all this medical care. And uh, so we just sat down and we listened to him. And then he, he came back later on that week and Doug did some, t they did some lab testing and um, he did go get a chest x-ray and, and things like that. And then um, he put this on his Facebook page, and he said, uh, I've been at my lowest of health conditions ever for almost now one year. I've visited hospitals and have been seen by doctors, and I must confess that this doctor I started seeing on Saturday has amazed me, spent time with me, started on a comprehensive investigations and reigniting my fighting spirit, which was waning. He has convinced me that a doctor can go deep in investigations and apply highly skilled knowledge without the facility he is working in, focusing on squeezing every penny out of you and your family and what mission it is. And I just thought, you know, he's a, he's a pretty, he has a lot of influence, and for him to take the time to even post that on Facebook, to me seemed pretty remarkable that he was acknowledging that he had found hope again and just people willing to just sit down and listen to him because when you go over there, if you go in to see you know, any any health professional, they um, they're very quick to get you out because they're trying to make money, and so if you go in with something, they'll look at you. Uh, they may not even touch you, and then they'll give you a prescription, and you go fill that prescription, and that's the end of it. Um, one time we had a student at Tinzion come, and um, we thought maybe she had malaria, and so we we told her that you know it was like. It was a Saturday, we weren't really at the clinic. We said, why don't you just go to the clinic, get tested for malaria, and so she did. Well, when she went there, they told her she had pneumonia. They gave her antibiotic. They gave her like three medications to go get, to go get paid for. And so then the following Monday, she came back to us and she still had, she had pain in her chest. And that was her main symptom, was just pain by her ribs. And so, Doug, we, we took a look at her. She tested negative for malaria and, um, and she really, I didn't feel like she had malaria anyway. Her symptoms really weren't indicative of that. And Doug said, you know, because what I think you have is just, um, sometimes people get um, like an irritation, inflammation, where your rib, the cartilage joins onto your sternum. And he, by his assessment, that's what she had. She just had this inflammation. And so, I, and she didn't have a fever. And we said, we don't think you have pneumonia. We don't think you need this. Uh, antacid medicine, so quit taking all the medicines that they gave you and let's just try this uh, prednisone is what, what we gave her for three days worth. And, uh, you know, they didn't even listen, they didn't listen to her lungs when she went to that clinic to see if she was having trouble breathing. I mean, you know, you can hear if someone has congestion. And um, so she went off those, she tried the prednisone for three days and she was perfectly fine. So often, oftentimes we see so many mistreatments because the doctors there just don't, they don't really, aren't trained or they just don't think to go that extra step. So a lot, a lot of that. Um, also one time, and this was back when we were in Kasuma at the clinic there, a lady came in and her arm, her left arm was swollen all the way up. I mean, you could not miss it. It was, it was so swollen. And I don't know how she heard about us, how she came there, but uh, in, in assessing her, she had been seeing physicians for know, at least six months, maybe a year, and they had done all kinds of scans of her vessels. They thought maybe there was a blood flow problem. And so they were doing all these things, and the swelling just never went down, and she just had this issue. And Doug said, well, have they ever done a breast exam? Because here in the United States, if you have anything in, that involves your lymph flow out of your arm, you could have swelling. 
and she knew nobody had ever touched her at all. And so Doug did a, a breast exam, and she had a lump, and she was a, a pretty large woman. So he did got the ultrasound, and she, she did have a, a lump in her breast. She had a mass there. And I thought, you know, here this has been going on for six months to a year that no one has bothered to even investigate the idea that it could be something besides just blood flow problem in her arm. And so um, we were able to get her on the right track and, and get her to the right care. Um, so it seems like that you see weekly. Um, and so that's kind of, it's kind of been neat to be able to say, okay, let's get down to what the really the bottom diagnosis is on this. So um, that's, that's been a real blessing for the people there and for us too. Um, one of the other signs we have in the clinic, and we also have this at our house, is the scripture. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, because that's kind of our philosophy uh, in our work there, in our living there, is to seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Um, and that's kind of a, a review of the clinic. Um, I, I could go into more details about, you know, how much things cost, because the cost of living there is so, so much lower than it is here. Um, I'll just give you an example. Um, average salary for a nurse there is roughly $300 a month. And, that, and that's for someone who might even have a family, children to feed. And uh, so the cost of living and the pay is, is so, so much different than here. Um, so. That, that's, and I can answer more questions than that later if you guys have anything specific or any, anything like that. But uh, that's kind of the basic view of where we've been and what things look like for the last couple of years at the Owasi Clinic. Um, I wanted to go on. I don't know if anybody needs a stretch break or anything like that. I haven't been talking that long yet. But um, a year ago in August, um, we had been heading out to Owasi. Uh, we moved into the Owasi Clinic in May, so this has been several months we've been there, and um, we were taking out a, a little refrigerator that um, a friend had been given, and she was going back to Nigeria, so she said, here, you can have this refrigerator for the clinic. And we're like, great, we can put it in the kitchen. I'm thinking, we can have really cold you know, things to drink. <laughs> And everybody's, you know, the Kenyans are probably not even, that wasn't even on their radar. You know, they're well, maybe it could use for lab specimens or something. I'm like, whatever. So we were taking that out there on a Saturday. And on the way there, we, um, we had an accident. Uh, we were, Doug was trying to avoid a, a baby uh, goat. And uh, the brakes in the car that we were driving um, weren't the best. And so we kind of fishtailed around and a a big boxier type of white car that does a lot of transportation issues, it, it T-boned us and it hit us on my side of the car. And um, I just wanted to kind of maybe review some of the things. I don't know if you guys have read any of the write-ups for like the Women's Council newsletter or things like that, but um, that um, was something that really kind of changed my perspective on life. And for any of you that have had disruptions in your life with um, trauma, grief, uh, pain, anything like that, um, I think you would probably have a little bit of understanding of that. And I think probably if I look around this room, most of us have had something in our life that has kind of resettled us in what, where we're going with our life. But um, I know that many of you were praying for, for me in that whole situation, and um, we really could feel those prayers. Um, um, you know, when, when we had the accident and um, I was, well, once the, once the dust, the dust settled down, um, I was unconscious. I was bleeding from my nose and my ear and um, Doug had to help get out of his car because his jaw was kind of jammed. And so the guy who hit us, his, not that much damage was done to his car, so he's actually able to get out get dug out, and then they were able to open my door. They were able to flag a lady that was driving by. She wasn't from the area. She stopped, and rather than lay me down on the tarmac road, they were able to just transfer me directly from the vehicle we were in to that lady's front seat passenger 
and then Doug was able to get behind and, and keep my head stable because at that time they really didn't know, he didn't know, you know, if I had fractures, cervical fractures, nothing. And um, it's interesting because um, when you look back, and uh, even as I learn more things today, you can see where um, God was aware, and he was in and moving through the whole situation because even before the accident, uh, you know, when Doug comes to the United States, he works as a physician in ER. So he has to get training once a year for advanced trauma life support, ATLS. And so he had made arrangements to do that in Nairobi. And it was that class was supposed to be held that weekend that we were doing all that traveling. But then a few days before, he got a notice that said the class was canceled. Um, so he didn't have to do that. But in preparation for that class, he reviewed the manual. He had done so, so much review that when we had that accident, and he saw me unconscious. He, everything he needed to do was right there in his mind. Couldn't have been better planning. Um, and some people say, well, you know, that may not be a God thing. But um, for us, it was obviously that God had prepared him for what he would need to know. And not just at that accident time when it happened, but in the days following. Um, so... Um, this lady, they were able to take us to a private hospital in Kasumu. Um, and uh, the lady who took us, she just didn't want any compensation, monetary compensation. She just wished us well and went on her way. When we got there, there was a medical student who was working in the emergency department. And um, they kind of did some scans. They kind of did a preliminary thing of what they thought was going on. Of course, I had many fractures in my spine, my ribs, head injury, um, all those things. Um, but one other thing that I thought was pretty interesting, because of the lab equipment that we had gotten at the clinic, they had run like a, uh, my labs just to see how things were working. And so they, they had my baseline hemoglobin hematocrit. They had my baseline uh, electrolyte, like chemicals in your bodies. They had all that information. So that when they took me and ran that there at the hospital in Kasumu, they had, a, they had a baseline. Well, this is what she was running before the accident, and this is what she is now. I mean, again, the timing of that, only, only God, God had a hand in that. Um, once we got to the emergency room, um, uh, an elder, uh, Evans Otiano, came and he administered to me. And, you know, that was still when there was COVID precautions, so they wouldn't let just anybody come in. And uh, after that administration, um, I started to, my, my mental status started to improve. And I was able to, actually was able to thank Evans for praying for me. Um, I have no memory of any of this. I have no memory of anything until I, well, I was in South Africa, and that had been maybe a week or so there. So I have no memory of this, so I'm just taking off what, what notes Doug wrote. But, um, so again, from even from the very beginning and even into that administration, prayer was very, very uh, active in all our decisions. Um, you know, later on after we came home, we found out that all you guys have been praying to. In fact, um, when we got back to the United States, um, and I had on my neck brace, I had on my crutches, and uh, we went to a, a, a home of a young man who goes to church with us. He was having the cider press, and I said, Doug, I go, I just I really want to get out of the house. I just, I know I'm not in the best shape, and I don't look that great, but I go, I really want to get out of the house. So we went to Jesse's Cochran's home where they were having the cider press, and uh, there was a man there that I did not know. I greeted him, and after I walked away, he said, who was that? What's happened to her? And they said, well, that's Judy Smith. And she had a car accident. He goes, Judy Smith? He goes, well, um, we, had a, we had a prayer for her. We were, he went to the Oak Grove congregation, and I can't think of his name right now. Um, uh, but when they heard the news that the accident happened, um, Cal Chadwick said, hey, everybody, come on, gather around. We're going to have a prayer right now. And that's what they did. And um, this gentleman... That had stuck in his memory. And so when he saw me, you know, walking around uh, with the, my crutches and things, he then shared that with me. He said, you know, we just stopped what we were doing at Autumn and 
had a prayer for you. He goes, it's just so good to see you here and, and that you're as you are, right? Um, so again, that was just another added experience that um, what you guys were doing here, uh, going to the Lord. Um, at that private hospital in uh, Kasumu, um, it was kind of frustrating for Doug because um, as things are there, they couldn't find they couldn't find things like before they knew I had fractured my hip in several places, my pelvis in several places. They were trying to put me on a bedpan to get a urine specimen, and Doug said, "I don't think you should do that just yet." Um, and so they went to go find a Foley catheter, which is a little tube you know they put up in your bladder, and they couldn't find one of those for the longest times. And you know this is an emergency department, so even though we you know, we went to the hospital thinking it was probably the better one in Kasumu. They still weren't really, they just weren't used to that kind of situation. And so it was like that with lab, lab tests and things like that. Um, and so Doug was kind of really getting concerned that things were not moving along and, you know, my blood pressure wasn't very good and my, my level of consciousness, I was confused. And um, so um, he was getting concerned. Um, a lot of people from the church had come to the hospital because, again, when someone's ill or hurt, you go to pray with them in person. Um, and I know we go and visit people in the hospital who are sick, but they, they want to come right away, and they want to do that. So you had people coming um, from pretty good distances who were wanting to come and pray with me, but they couldn't do that because of COVID. And so sometimes um, Doug would go out in the parking lot and just pray with them for me and just be with them. Um, so that was, again, prayer was so, so much of it. Um, after a couple days there, Doug started thinking, you know, this really isn't, I'm really not feeling very good about what's going on here because essentially nothing was going on there. Um, and so he had called, we have like a certain insurance for people who do missionary work. Um, and so he had called them and said, you know, what's the possibility of getting her transferred out of this area? And they said, well, pretty expensive, and there was really no way we could afford the cost for me to be air flighted out or even moved to a different place. And I'm not sure even Nairobi would have been some place that I would have been comfortable going to, even though they're a little bit more advanced. And so after talking with them, Doug misdialed a number. He called again. He misdialed the number. He got um, uh, a nurse who was from Indianapolis in the United States. And she said, well, let me get a hold of our medical director in London and have him see what, if he can help out at all. So um, the doctor there in London called Doug and talked to the doctors there at that hospital. And they decided that, yeah, she she probably does need to go to a different facility. And he was, he was thinking that the ideal place for me to go would be in South Africa because they have a trauma center there. But at that time, when Doug was on the phone, the hospitals had been closed down to admissions because of a COVID variant that they had encountered. And so that didn't look like it was going to work. So the next place was London. And London was going to be twice as far, which meant twice as long for me in the air, um, and just not the best, best situation. Um, but, um, so Doug, they, pray, they prayed again. They prayed about this situation again. And then by the end of the day, we found out that they were taking emissions in South Africa now. And so they were able to make plans for me to be airlifted to South Africa. Um, to fly out of Kenya, you had to have a negative COVID test. And so, um, they just don't run COVID tests over there in the hospital. They don't do that. So you would have to get an outside facility to do that testing. And all the things that, you know, they were trying to get coordinated to get that testing done was not working out. And so they prayed again. And then Eric remembered that he had a friend um, in Kasumi who worked for the CDC, the American CDC. And, and so Eric called him and he explained the situation. And at 8 o'clock at night, this guy came who, he didn't know Eric, really. He just, by name, and he didn't know us. He came, uh, did the test, took it back to his lab there, and got that negative test that night so that both Doug and I were ready to go the next morning. 
the next morning, they're out, they're out on the tarmac waiting for the little air jet to get fueled up. And uh, Doug went to go see uh, the immigration department there at the airport. And they said, well, OK, you have your COVID. Do you have your yellow fever? Uh, proof that you've had yellow, yellow fever immunizations. And Doug's like, well, no one told me that I needed that to leave Kenya going to South Africa. And they said, oh, yeah, yep, you cannot, cannot go anywhere unless you have that yellow fever. So um, Doug did not know if he was going to be able to travel with me, but he had prayed. when He sent Eric to our apartment to get this purple folder I have, an accordion folder, and it has a lot of our important papers in. He said, he said, Eric, if you can look for that and see if you can find Judy's yellow fever, because he had, he had proof of his yellow fever, but no proof of mine. And um, Doug had just felt like the Lord had helped him in, in getting all those things ready to go, too. And um, when, when, he, when he found out that my yellow fever wasn't in that purple accordion thing, um, the guy's like, well, what's going on? And so Doug said, well, my wife is getting transferred to South Africa. And, and so he said, well, let me see. So the guy actually came out of the tarmac, saw me with all my tubes, my chest tubes and stuff. He said, oh, go, go. And so he, he let us go. So again, another answered prayer because there was just certain obstacles along the way that all you could do is just say, God, we need your help. Uh, you need to provide the pathway. And um, so it was just it was just like that again and again. Um, um, when we got to South Africa, it was it was late at night. It was after midnight. And um, when they got there, I wasn't really I wasn't doing very well. I wasn't very stable. My again, my blood pressure was low and um, my electrolytes were off because of my head injury. And um, I did wake up and I I said. You know what's going on, Doug? So we're in South Africa, and I said, "Well, uh, can can Eric pray for me?" He said, "Well, you know, Eric's in Kenya." He goes, "But we can call him on the phone." So he called Eric, and Eric um, prayed. Um, and I, I, I'm guessing I was alert and I awake and hearing this. I don't remember, but um, and so even after that time, um, my electrolyte levels in my blood they started to get more normal. And um, so we felt like, again, God was still with us through this journey of just getting stabilized. Um, a couple days later, um, I, had, uh, I, was in, I was in the intensive care unit, um, and I had a really bad dream. And I remember this dream. It was very, very odd. I, I felt like somebody was getting a zipper installed on their chest. And it was just they wanted to put them on me, these zippers. And, and so it was, I was just... and I'm. I think a lot of the problem was I was still really confused because of my electrolyte imbalance for my brain. And so when I woke up from this dream, I just, I was really, really upset. And I didn't feel like I wanted to go back to sleep because I didn't want to have that dream again. And so Doug had, um, he called back home and he talked to the kids um, and he asked them to, the families to pray for me. And my grandkids were, they could really relate to bad dreams because they had bad dreams. And so they prayed, and I was able to go to bed that night, and I never had that bad dream again, never bad dreams since. Um, so again, I felt like again and again, uh, whenever there was a problem, prayers were answered. And not, not days later, just pretty much immediately answered. Um, so when I, when I look back over these things, I'm like, you know, God, God was right there, and even though I don't remember it, when I read back over it or I remember it, it's just like, you know, God was moving with us every step of the way. Another blessing we had that um, we thought EFCO was going to have to start medical school in September. So I thought we'll have to shut down the clinic for the time we're gone. But then EFCO got a call from medical school saying that they were postponing the start of school for another month. So Epica was able to stay there and, and just kind of see patients or just make sure things at the clinic were going well for another month through September until he had to go back to Nairobi. Um, um, as I came home and I saw follow-up with specialists, even, even as, as late as uh, November this year, I went to go see a, an orthopedist about my fracture because uh, I have a couple of screws now, some hardware. 
uh, back of my pelvis. And I was told to follow up with a year about that, whether those could be removed or not. And I also, I'm a little short-legged on one side, and <laughs> I kind of had noticed that too. And my physical therapist had given me like an insert to put on my shoe so it could be level. And so I went to go see, see this orthopedist, and I... I was just praying that God would help me find someone in a timely manner because nowadays, if you go in to see a specialist, you sometimes have to wait months to get to see someone. And this is a doctor I'd seen several years ago when I had an injury. And so I thought, well, I'll try going back to him. And um, so I made the appointment, went in to see him, and he actually had x-rays from when I was there before, you know, years earlier. And so uh, when he took x-rays of me now and he put them up on the, the screen, I was like, I go, oh, yeah, I can, I can definitely tell there's been, I've been hit on that left side because my, my bones didn't look the same like the other one. And he said, oh, wait a minute, Judy. He goes, just wait a minute. Calm down, calm down. He goes, you got to remember, this was taken with you laying on a bed, so it could be positional. And so then he just proceeded to very patiently say, you know, this is the measurement here. We look at this measurement. And... Because he had my my normal X-ray, he could just he could just show me and calm me down, and I went away from that appointment feeling much more peace, and also um, having a little train of thought here. You guys, bear with me here. Um, I just felt like that um, when when I was talking with him, he said, "You know, Judy he goes that was that was a pretty." pretty severe trauma you had to your pelvic there. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, okay. I know, you know, I kind of understand that, even though I really didn't understand it. I mean, there's a lot of vessels and nerves that go through our pelvis, right? But I just really don't appreciate that sometimes. And he said, yeah, that was, that was quite the deal. And I said, well, you know, um, you know, they put the screws in. I go, my other option for treatment in Kenya would have been just to be in traction on my back for um, six weeks. And that's, and I said, you know, so we were able to get the screws put in, so I was able to start walking earlier. He, he started to laugh. He said, he goes, well, even here in the United States back in the 90s, if you would have come in with that injury, we could have put you in just flatbed traction for six weeks. He goes, and I said, well, what about the bed sores and all those things with movement that you would have had? He goes, that was just part of the treatment plan. And so I was just reminded again that... Just was I was blessed in my recovery to get it moving by the the path God was able to let us down in getting treated um, surgically with those those um, screws in my hip or my my uh, sacrum. Um, um, I will say that um, having that experience changed my outlook on the way I looked at things. And earlier, you know, I said that Doug had this testimony for what was needed in, in Africa. And I was kind of going along with him, supporting him. But there were times when I would grow weary of being so relied on, even in the congregation, for music and teaching and just all those things. And um, after this experience, I thought, um, I'm, what, what, God, what does God need for me to do for the work of his kingdom? Um, and and I'm, I'm happy to do anything, and I'm happy to do whatever needs to be done, and why wouldn't I be willing to do that now? So it, it really changed my perspective on what I could be doing for the work of the Lord's kingdom right now. Um, and, you know, before, before I was, had that accident, I had never had anything like that ever happen to me in my life. My mom and dad had died, but I hadn't. In our family, we had never had anything bad happen, no medical problems, nothing. In fact, Sylvia Powell reminded me, she goes, Judy, do you remember that time we were at that women's retreat in Kenya? And you said, you know, I've never had anything bad happen to me. And I said, well, yeah, I do remember that. She goes, and now look what's happened. <laughs> she goes, she just kind of reminded me that at one point in time, I was free from that experience. And now, now I did have that empathy, I guess you could say, with what it was like. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's really opened my my eyes to a lot of things that I need to be doing. Um, so it, it just made me, it, it gave me a new awareness. It, it's made my, me pray differently. It's made me sing differently. Um, I often find myself wanting to speed up the hymns a little bit more <laughs> because I just feel like um, 
I knew God was real, and I've had experience in my life where I know he is, he is God and he is there. Um, but I feel like through the experiences and things that happen in our lives, we kind of get distracted sometimes. And we, sometimes when we pray, we, we, we just kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like we, we don't always really understand who we're talking to. We're talking to a power that has created the earth, who knows every inch of us. And so if we go to him, why do we go to him so lightly sometimes? And I got after Doug because, you know, I've heard people say, let's have a quick prayer. And like, now wait, wait a minute. Why, why are we saying let's have a quick prayer? If someone's praying, if they feel led to pray for two minutes, then that should happen. But I, I know that we say that because we're trying to reassure people around us that we aren't going to go off praying and praying and praying and praying. I know that's, we're just saying let's, let's have a quick prayer so we aren't making everybody anxious. But things like that, I just am like, we can't say that anymore, you guys. We, we, it's, God is not someone we go to quickly. I mean, we can. And in, in case we need to, we can. But to approach him on a day-to-day basis when we aren't in an emergency or anything like that, we, we need to take time to know who we're approaching. Um, so um, there's a scripture from John 16, the word of God, that says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me, in me you might have peace. In the world, you should have you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And again, um, as I look out, I know many of you guys have gone through tribulation. You've gone through things that have disrupted your life. And when I came back, I I, I wanted to do things a little bit differently as far as ministry to people. Um, I didn't want to be the person. I wanted to be the person that goes to that person and see them face to face to pray with them, like they did in Kenya. I wanted to be the person who, no matter what, takes time to take a phone call or to reach out because of the ministry that I had. And so I kind of, uh, I have been studying, read some articles, um, and I kind of came up with some, um, some ideas that I think, as far as ministry, for each of us, as we reach out to people who have gone through trouble, um, some things we need to be aware of. And there's eight things here that I kind of highlighted. And one is that um, trauma or grief, it, it changes us forever. Uh, I, hope I, I hope I don't change with the way I'm looking at things now, 10 years down the road. I hope I'm still wanting, having this enthusiasm and, and vigor to, do, to be working for God's kingdom. And the thing with, with anything that disrupts our lives, um, we don't really, you don't get over it. And you hear people say, well, just, just get over it. Get on with your life. But we really don't. And... Having faith and uh, reconciliation with God softens that awareness um, and it helps us to navigate the changes we need to do, but it's always a part of our life. Um, I, I'm looking out at Karen. Uh, you know, she's had her thyroid removed because she's had thyroid cancer. For the rest of her life, she will live with having to take medications or the awareness that she's had her thyroid removed. And so that's not going to be something that's going to, she's going to forget down the road. It's going to be part of her life. Um, there's a new normal now, okay? Uh, there's, if you've had that issue, there's, it's not going to be bad. I'm going to be back to the old me. I'm thinking you, Linda, too, even with your surgeries. I mean, life is different for you now. If, and depending on your relationship with God and how much you are reconciled with him, it will determine how you're going to deal with that. And I have found through life experience and authors who study that when we have something that disrupts our lives, we're either drawn closer to God or we back away from God. And sometimes we lose faith in God. And so um, it's our choice. Um, and, and when we go through a trauma, it, the goal is not to just kind of push paper and make it look that your life is back to normal or that, um, that you know, you're dealing with it okay. But we need to be able to wear that new life with all the unpleasant things may be. It may be, you know, something you wear or something you maybe can't walk as well, but um, um, you, you wear that with every day with courage because you know that God is going to see you through. And that is something that I definitely have learned through this, that God is going to be walking with me every, every bit of my life. Um, the next one is um, I want you to remember uh, that presence is always better than distance. And sometimes when we have been with people who have had a crisis, illness, whatever, cancer, um, 
sometimes we have the impression that they need their space. And I don't know how that, ever, that assumption ever got started, but I don't think it's true. Um, and especially in our fellowship and being the body of Christ, I feel like that is part of the ministry we're called to do is to reach out to people. Because when you go through something that disrupts your life, you have that, um, it's a lonely time. It can be a lonely time. When you are by yourself and when no one's around, it can be a lonely time. And even when you're surrounded by people you love, you still have that feeling inside of yourself that you are alone. And it can be unbearable. And um, so everybody out there, we don't need to assume that someone else is showing up uh, or that someone else is covering all the bases. Um, so it's just so much easier to say, um, if, if, if you go to someone who's suffering and they don't want you there, it's so much easier for them to say, you know, I appreciate your love, but, you know, I really, I just need to be by myself for a time, rather than them saying later on down the road, I was hurting and no one was there for me. No one cared for me. Um, so if someone needs space, we can respect that. Otherwise, be there. Uh, let them know that you are standing beside them as they go down this journey. Um, in coming back, uh, I was talking with a good friend, and she had, um, her husband had left her. Uh, he had fallen another, with another woman. And she was, um, she had called for the priesthood to come and minister to her. And then she was, then sharing with me, she was saying, you know, and after they left, they never checked back in with me at all. They, they didn't, they didn't follow up at all. And she was kind of, kind of, kind of disgruntled that these, these priesthood members didn't follow up with her. And I said, I said, well, well now wait a minute. I go, where was I? <laughs> Where was I when you were going through that time? Where, where were the other people in your, in your congregation? Uh, because why would we assume that just because someone's a priesthood member that that's their responsibility to care for you and your grief and your pain? I should have been there. I should have been doing that. And then I got to thinking, why, why wasn't I there? And then I thought, because I was grieving too about the whole thing. So that was inhibiting, I think, people from stepping out because we were all grieving over this thing that affected the whole congregation. But yet, um, that is one thing I think we need to, we need to just step out of what, we, what comforts us and, and step forward and say to those people, we're here for you, even if it's just to sit with them. You don't have to say anything. Just sit with them, listen to them, say a prayer for them. Uh, presence is always going to be better. Um, I just want to remind you that healing uh, is not a gradual up thing. Okay, it can go up, it can go down. It can go up and down. it's seasonal. Healing happens with time, uh, but our emotional healing, how we think about it, uh, sometimes can get kind of wobbly. Instead of a straight line, it could be like a figure eight. Um, so that's pretty normal, and we need to be aware of that as well. That even months after someone maybe loses a loved one or has an operation, we assume, well, they're getting better. You know, they're doing well. Don't assume that. Continue to check in with them and let them know that you're with them. And you're standing beside them. Um, I was reading an article about uh, that a woman had, she had suffered in their family. They had a death, and she had a really, really bad accident. And she uh, came up with this idea that I thought was pretty good. She said, surviving trauma takes firefighters and builders and very few of us can do both those jobs well. And firefighters are those people, you know, that when something happens, they drop everything. I'm oh, sorry. They drop everything. They run to that person, and they're there. And, and so they're there in the, the uh, getting you ready to, to do whatever needs to be done. And if you're a builder, you're the person who they help you get out back into your footing into the world, and they're there for months and years helping you rebuild to where you can cope and function with your new life and whatever you've gone through. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I never really thought about it that way, but when I, I look at different situations that I've seen in our lives, I do see those people, you know, they, they're right there, they're right there with the meals, you know, they're, they're right there to do whatever you need to do. But it's those other people that continue to follow with you through the long haul of that continued recovery and, and healing. Um, 
Grieving is social, and so is healing. Um, pain that we're feeling inside of ourselves is private, but, um, but God made us as people to have contact with people. And um, it's through our relationships we have with each other that really, really allow that healing, just like when I talked about some of the other things. Um, sometimes um, we may not, um, we may get a lot of support from people maybe outside of our family more than inside of our family. And you're like, well, why is that? It's just the way, the way the social action works. But um, it's, it's important to remember to, to uh, be there in the social situations. Um, one other thing that I thought was very important, um, don't offer platitudes or comparisons. And this is so, I, I have, I've done this in the past. We really need to be aware that we should not go in and say, uh, I'm so sorry I lost your son, you know, we lost our dog last year, you know, so do not, do not, do not try to let them know you understand through what your understanding of grief is and compare it to theirs because, you know, I look out here and we all look at things differently. I may think, oh, I think they probably think a little bit like me, but you may think of things very, very differently than me. And again, uh, and they, or people might say, um, you'll be stronger when this is over. Or, you know, God works in all things, so hang in there. He, or, he works all things for good. Uh, when someone is in the midst of pain, they just need to know you love them. They don't need to hear, you know, that you have, you have simply, similar empathy with them. And, you know, there are times when people will have had a very similar experience to you, and you know them, and you know who they are, and that, that will help you. But a lot of times we, we always feel like we have to say something. And sometimes we just need to be quiet and just let them know that we love them. Um, another thing is, let them tell their own story. When you go to be with someone, just let them talk. You don't have to, you don't have to give any advice. You don't have to give any information. Just let them say their own story. Um, um, and, and that's just what, that's really the basic thing that we, they need. Um, we don't want to give them our opinion. We just, we need to hear what they have to say because sometimes when we listen to them, and give them the opportunity. Uh, we may learn something about them or what's going on in their lives that we didn't know. Um, love can show up in unexpected ways. Um, sometimes after something's happened, you know, it's the strangers in the community you see that come to support that family rather than people who are the closest to them. And if there was a good uh, beatitude for this, I, it, w it would probably have to be, blessed are those who give love to anyone in times of hurt. Okay, that would be uh, the beatitude that I would give today um, for myself and my experience. And when I look at what happened to us in Kenya, and I look at what's happened in some of your lives, it's so small as to part how it's affected you, um, because it, it's it's not it's not a, a big thing compared when I compare myself to other people. But I will say that um, each time I received a phone call or got a text message or a card, I just felt such encouragement um, and strength to my faith in God. Um, and each time someone brought a meal uh, or just helped us in different ways, uh, again, I, I received encouragement and I received strength in my faith every time. And sometimes I would get cards from people I hadn't seen in years. I'd be like, how, how loving is it for them to take the time to, to touch base with me again? Again, it just, it just brought me up. It just strengthened me so much. And I would never really realized that before in the past until this happened. Um, I, felt a, I feel the great need to communicate better with, with people that I know. Um, and I just, I have this, like I said, a renewal to get involved with uh, whatever the Lord has to do for the kingdom. Um, so I just want to remind you guys that um, at the, the end of even my experience, even though I'm, I'm moving on and trying to, to get stronger and getting better, um, that um, 
I, I've changed my prayer, and the prayer is, now that I pray, is, God, what do you want me to know? And God, what do you want me to do? And so when I would maybe look at someone with who's grieving, I say, God, what do I need to know to help this person? And what do you need for me to do? And for me uh, to, to get moved move out of this, I've had to just keep taking steps. And for me, that's been a real visual lesson because for, at the beginning, it was very painful for me to take steps. And I just had to keep doing that. I just had to keep working at it. And then I lost my crutches. And so I was able to walk without crutches. And then I was able to not have support. And um, it was just a really a literal walking with the Lord to where I can cope better with my life. Um, so I just, um, I just want you guys to keep walking with the Lord as you minister to those people out there who have grief, who have need, who have had events in their lives that change the way they look at their life. Um, and because we've, we've all made a covenant with the Lord. We all have all been baptized with his Holy Spirit. And that spirit is what gives us the strength to be able to listen and hear him when he does direct us on what to do. And I just want to leave you with the scripture from Galatians chapter 5. And it says, the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so I just thank you again for um, your love, for your prayers. And I hope that today when you guys leave this place, maybe you'll have a heightened awareness of what you can be doing for our brothers and sisters that you are with at work, your church, whatever, and, and bring, some, bring some love into their life and remind them that God is with them because sometimes they might have some doubts about that too. Before we close, are there any questions for Judy that you might have today? I have to mention that too. Huh? I'm happy to answer any questions. If not, um, if you will turn in the purple hymnal to hymn number 490, I'll go where you want me to go. We'll have Marla will lead us out, and then Mary Sue Kennan will offer our closing prayer.
Heavenly Father. May these be not just words that we sing without thought. May these be words from our heart that we will be what you want us to be. We will do what you want us to do. Father, each day we have opportunity to serve thee by just loving, by being there for a kind word, a kind action, to people we may not even know that we just pass in as we're in a store on the street. Help us to see ourselves as an instrument in your hand. We might be your hands and your feet. We might be your word of kindness, of comfort to someone in need. Help our hearts to be open, Father, to the needs of others. Help our hearts and minds to be open to your promptings that we might follow through. Father, we are so grateful for the love that you have shown us. We cannot comprehend the love that Christ had when he gave himself. And he asks us to do the same. We thank you, Father, for those who have gone before us that have followed that plan, that have been your servants, your hands, your feet. We pray, Father, that you would bless us with your Holy Spirit as we leave here, that we might carry that spirit in all that we do and all that we say that we might truly be your servants. Bless us then, we pray. Forgive us when we are slothful. Make us mindful of our place before thee. Go with us, Father. We thank you for this time. And for these reminders, and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave his all. Amen.